Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is priceless, precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Tom? Uh, him on the back of your bulletin. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Jesus, thy blood and My beauty art, my glorious dress, midst flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. This spotless robe the same appears, when open the word of God to Hebrews, book of Hebrews, chapter 8, Hebrews, chapter 8. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the two tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not a man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses 
was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. But now ye have obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if he, of, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be with the, I will, will I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. This is us now, a blessing. This is describing a new birth. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every brother saith, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. For the least to the greatest. This is talking about the believers. The body of believers now is different than the body of Israel. Not all Israel was, uh, was of faith. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest greatest for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more it's a wonderful blessing that he does not remember our iniquities or our sins they all have been paid in Christ and he said a new covenant he have made has made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth all, is ready to vanish away. Father God, we come before you, and the only way we can come to you, and that is in Christ, in Christ's behalf, in his name, Father, to give you honor and glory. We, we hope that uh, you might accept all our songs or all our doings here in Christ, please, Father, send your Holy Spirit, Father, that uh, the message might be a blessing, may exalt Christ. We need of your Spirit to be able to uh, clear our eyes and our ears that we may see Christ's glory more and more and more. May we see Christ more glorious every time. May we see our need for him more and more, Father. We thank you for the pastor. We ask you to bless him, Father, that you may bless his message, fill him with the Holy Spirit. We pray the same for all the other churches that preach the gospel, that glorify Christ, Father. Once again, we thank you for this wonderful privilege that we have, this wonderful blessing that we have to be here, and we recognize our need for you to come down today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together once again. We'll sing hymn number 158. 158 from the hardback. Come, Holy Spirit. 
prepared special music. salvation for me and the victory was his for the claiming by his blood I've been redeemed it is finished the battle is over it is finished There'll be no more war. It is finished, the end of the conflict. It is finished, and Jesus is Lord.
I don't know, three greater words in the scriptures. It is finished. (laughs) Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Speak ye comfortably unto Jerusalem and cry unto her and tell her that her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. (laughs) And she has received of the Lord double for all her sins. It's finished. Wow. Everything necessary for a sinner to stand in the presence of a holy God was accomplished by what the Lord Jesus Christ finished on Calvary's cross. He put away all the sins of all of God's people. There's nothing for us to do to add to that. We dare not take away from it. It's finished. Oh, and that's the labor, isn't it? The labor is to enter into his rest. Because by nature, by nature, and you go, I so appreciate that passage you read from Hebrews. By nature, we want to do something. I want to try to bring a message from Psalm 107, if you'll turn with me there in your Bibles. And I've titled this message, Understanding Grace. Understanding Grace. Now, there is a a huge sense in which we don't understand anything. How can we understand the nature of God? How can we understand what sin really is? How can we understand uh, the incarnation? How can we understand uh, the work of atonement? How can we understand sovereignty? (laughs) These things are beyond our comprehension, aren't they? Everything is beyond our comprehension. We, we, We understand so little of what we believe to be true. But why do we believe it? Because the Spirit of God suddenly came and a voice from heaven spoke and we all of a sudden believed. (laughs) We just believed. We could not believe. We just believe what God says and we hang all the hopes, all the hopes of our salvation, not on our understanding, but on Christ. And faith is that chain, if you will, that links the ship to the anchor. And uh, Christ is that anchor that has been set sure. Nevertheless, if we, if we take this word understanding as what it means, discerning, discerning the difference, There is a very real sense in which this whole book, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, is a distinction between law and grace. Every message, every story, every historical setting, God is setting at odds, contrasting for us the difference between salvation by works and salvation by grace. There is a way which seems right unto man. Now that way which seems natural unto us is that we would earn favor with God by something we do or something we don't do. But in the end, that way leads to death. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. You're not going to be saved by your works. (laughs) You're going to be saved by his work. (laughs) His work is finished. Oh, that God would give us faith to believe him. And distinguishing grace to understand the difference between law and grace. Because here's the truth. Now, there's some here that have never... Heaven hasn't been opened yet. Their eyes have not been opened. Their ears have not been unstopped. They just, they come and they sit and they listen. And Pam was, Pam was talking to me during the break. And she said, you know, when, when Brian first heard the gospel, they lived down in, in um, Sebastian. 
She said, Brian drugged me up here, kicking and screaming. I didn't want to be here. And I thought, well, we got folks like that that are here right now. We got children like that that are here right now. You just come kicking and screaming. And then all of a sudden, one day, suddenly, I heard. I wasn't planning on hearing. Didn't want to be here. All of a sudden, one day, the Spirit of God was pleased to arrest me and stop me on my path of destruction and reveal Christ to me. What a blessing. But you know, even after that, we still, we still gravitate towards, towards works, don't we? <laughs> we have to keep hearing the gospel. Lest we, lest we, we lean on our works and, and rob Christ of his glory in salvation. That's the worst part about the gospel of works. The false gospel of works robs the Lord Jesus Christ of his glory. <laughs> now notice in Psalm 107, the last verse, verse 43, Whoso is wise. Now, in the Bible, you have wise people and you have foolish people. Now, we all act foolishly from time to time. But a fool in the scriptures is an unbeliever, and a wise person is a believer. And that's who the Lord's, whoever is a believer, whoever's got the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ, who's ever got faith to believe God. Look at, look at the rest of this verse. Whosoever is a believer is wise and will observe these things, believe these things, hold to these things, even they, shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Now, grace is not used as much in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. The concept is there, but the full revelation of grace doesn't come until after the appearance and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so one of the Old Testament words that communicates this truth of grace is the word loving kindness. And so that's why I've titled this message, Understanding Loving Kindness. Understanding grace. <laughs> uh, whosoever is wise and believes these things. What things? All the things that are here in Psalm 107. Even they. Even they. <laughs> even me? You mean I can discern the difference between law and grace? Yes. Even they shall understand grace. I want us to discern the difference between law and grace. And I want every time the, the, the evil head of law lifts its, lifts its head to, to threaten us or to rob us of our hope, that the Lord would remind us once again, it is finished. It's finished. We're saved by grace, sovereign grace, free grace, finished work of redemption. We looked at the first seven verses Wednesday night, so we're going to start in verse 8 this morning. Understanding grace. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Every good and perfect gift, James tells us in James chapter 1, comes down from our Father above with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Everything that we have has been given to us of God. The breath that we draw, the very next breath we draw, whatever abilities we have, whatever possessions we have, they belong to God. They don't belong to us. They're on loan to us. <laughs> Oh, that men would praise God for his wonderful works and for his goodness towards men. Let me ask you a question. What is it that you deserve right now? God gave you what you deserve. You ask my children, <clears throat> when they were teenagers, if they had ever said to me, uh, Dad, that's not fair. 
You ask them what kind of question, what kind of response they got from me. You know what's fair. If you and I got what we deserved, we'd go to hell. We'd be separated from God and torment for all eternity. That's what's fair. That's, what's, that's what we deserve, isn't it? Now, let me ask you a second question. What do you have in your life that's better than that? <laughs> and the answer to that question is everything. <laughs> everything. Oh, that men would praise God for his goodness. Everything is his goodness. And for his wonderful works. Now, what is the... Now, that being put aside... You see... That obligates all men to thank God for what they have. Regardless of whether they're a believer or an unbeliever, all men ought to thank God for everything they've got. For everything they've got is more than they deserve. But oh, what do we have thankful to be thankful for, brethren? His wondrous works, <laughs> His finished work of redemption. Not only do we enjoy His providence in this life, but we enjoy the benefits of of his grace, of his mercy, of his salvation, the hope of eternal life, to know God, to have my sins forgiven. Well, who has reason to praise God more than the child of God? Oh, that men would praise God for his... Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children... By Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Oh, that men would praise God. We have reason to praise God, don't we? It's, he predestinated us. He saved us. By Jesus Christ, he adopted us into his family. He made us to be his children to the praise of his grace. <laughs> oh, that men would that men would praise God and thank God for the blessings of his grace and of his mercy. How far short we fall of that. Look at verse seven. He led them forth by the right way. <laughs> there's a right way and there's a wrong way in this world. There's one right way and there's a whole bunch of wrong ways. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He led them to Christ. And then he led them by Christ. <laughs> he didn't just lead them to believe on Christ. Now the Lord Jesus Christ leads them in the way <laughs> and keeps pointing them back to himself. Oh, that men would praise God. This is, the, this is what it is to understand grace. That all that we have in this world and in the next is by the grace of God. It's all of grace. All of grace. I haven't used this example in some time, but I think it's a good one. Because we hear of grace being free, unmerited favor. Um, if on your way home... You roll down your window at a stoplight and you hand someone at the side of the road begging for money, a dollar bill, that's unmerited favor. They didn't do anything to deserve it. You gave it to them freely. You didn't get anything in return. You roll up your window and you drive on. Now, what if you pull up to the stop sign and there's a guy standing there who just got out of prison for killing your only child. And he's asking you for money. And you don't just roll down the window and hand him a dollar. You unlock the passenger door 
and you invite him into your car and you take him home with you and you clean him up and you give him a room in your house and then you go down to the courthouse and you adopt him into your family and make him one of your children. That's grace. You see, grace is much more than unmerited favor. It's demerited favor. Because that's what the Lord's done for us. It was our sin that put his son on Calvary's cross. And he didn't just give us enough to get us by for another meal or get us through this life. He took us and adopted us into his family and made us his own and provided us everything we needed for our salvation. That's grace. And anything else is works. Look at verse 9. Understanding grace. That's what we hope to leave here doing this morning. Understanding grace. Understanding that everything we have is by the grace of God. Understanding his wonderful works and praising him and glorifying him and giving him all the honor and all the praise for all that we have in this life and in the next. For he satisfieth the longing soul and he filleth the hungry soul with goodness. <laughs> you see, we're in this world, ah, we're... We're eating all the rotten flesh of this world. We're drinking the the polluted cisterns of this world. And and, uh, then the Lord puts in our soul a desire for more. Lord, this is just not it. This is not it. I've got to have more. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I know I've made this point a couple times recently, but let me make it again. That doesn't mean that you will be blessed of God if you will hunger and thirst after righteousness. What that means is that if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness and you're not satisfied with what this world has to offer, it's because God has blessed you. (laughs) And he didn't bless you without hunger, without feeling that hunger. (laughs) You see what? The need that God creates, he satisfies. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And if he leaves you satisfied with the things of this world, you see, most folks are just satisfied with what they've got. Or they think that if they could just get a little bit more of what they already have, they'd be satisfied. And so they're just pursuing the things of this world. And, you know, I just get a little more. <laughs> then I'll be satisfied. He satisfieth the hungry soul, the hungry soul, the hungry soul that thirsts after righteousness. He satisfies them and he fills them. For once we rest our soul in Christ, once we are able by the grace of God to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, once God has given us some discernment about grace and we see that everything we have is by grace, We know God's satisfied, and if God's satisfied, then how can I not be satisfied? I'm satisfied with Christ. I don't want to add to what Christ has done. I don't want to rob him of his glory. I'm satisfied. I can sit. I can rest. I can believe on Christ. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. If the Lord has not filled your soul with Christ and enabled you to rest in Christ and believe upon Christ and be satisfied with Christ and you're still trying to fill that God-shaped void in your heart with the things of this world, thinking if I just get a little bit more, then I'll be satisfied. You're never going to be satisfied. Ever. I told you, I heard a a um, interview that someone had done with uh, uh, 
Mr. Rogers' wife. You know, Mr. Rogers, the TV child, he, he died this past year. I heard an interview that someone did with his wife. And she was recounting the last days of Mr. Rogers' life on his deathbed. And she said that he kept asking me, he kept asking me, honey, do you think I've done enough? And she kept comforting him by telling him, yes, honey, you've done enough. It's okay, you've done enough. Now that's what it is not to be satisfied with Christ. You think I've done enough? Can I do a little bit more? I, you people leave this world thinking, if I, I don't know if I've done enough. Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister, as you might know, and he didn't understand grace. He was still hoping to be able to stand in the presence of God by something that he had done. Being satisfied. Having your soul satisfied means that you're satisfied with Christ and you're not looking to anything else for the hope of your salvation. And that's grace. <laughs> if God's giving you that grace, ah, oh, that's a discerning works in grace, isn't it? Look at the next look at the next verse. Such as sit in darkness in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. And what does the addict say? I can quit anytime I want. And what, is the, what does the religious person say? I'll believe when I get ready to believe. No, you won't. <laughs> and what's the child of God say? I was bound in darkness. I could not believe. I wasn't able to see. I wasn't able to come. I wasn't able to hear. I, I could not believe. I was bound. Until the Lord came. And brought down the gates of hell. <laughs> And brought me out and made me to hear. I was a slave to my sin. I couldn't believe the gospel. You see, if you think you can believe the gospel whenever you want to believe the gospel, then you're not bound. You're not in darkness. You're not in chains. <laughs> you, you're like, you are, but you just don't know it. You know, it's like the addict who thinks, well, I can get loose anytime I want. <laughs> Here's grace. Lord, I was sitting in darkness. I was in the shadow of death. I was a dead man on my way to hell. And there wasn't anything I could do about it. And you came and stopped me. By your grace. I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't force your hand. I didn't manipulate you. I didn't decide one day I was going to let you come into my heart. <laughs> I didn't turn over a new leaf. I didn't get religious. Lord, I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and you quickened me and made me to be alive. <laughs> Verse 11. You know, we're, we're answering this question. They that observe these things, they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. That's the last verse of this psalm. These are the things. And there's several, there are several messages in Psalm 107. We already preached one Wednesday night. We're going to do one this morning and we'll probably do another one this coming Wednesday night. There's so much in this psalm about understanding grace. Look at, look at, the, next, look at the next verse. Because they rebelled against the words of God. <clears throat> Lord, I was a rebel. I was hell bent. I, I, I was saying in my heart, I will not have that man reign over me. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and Lord, you had to knock me off my high horse. You had to make me, you had to cause me to bow. You had to turn me. You turned. My sword into plowshare. <laughs> you turned my spear into a pruning fork. You made me from a rebel that was at enmity with you and going against you 
to one that was planting the seeds of the gospel. <laughs> oh, Saul of Tarsus had his fist raised to heaven, didn't he? And the Lord, Lord made him a minister of the gospel. And all, all of us are. When the Lord saves you and puts the seed of Christ in your heart, you've got the word of God. <laughs> See, this isn't just for the just for the preacher, is it? They rebelled against the words of God. I didn't believe God's word. I just didn't think it was important. And if I, if I did have an interest in the Bible, I twisted the word of God to my thinking. I, I, made, it, I made it so that it was a message of works so that I could get the glory for my salvation. I didn't believe what God was saying. It was all about Christ. It was all for him. I was a rebel against the word of God. And they contemned the counsel of the Most High. I didn't have any interest in, in God's counsel or in God's word. You say, well, I've never, I've never been against God's word. I've always, you know, the Lord said, if you're not for me, you are against me. <laughs> always, if you don't love God's word, believe God's word, there's only two places to be. You, you, either, you either love him or you hate him. It's, it's, Lord, I was a rebel. I was in darkness. I was dead. I was bound in the afflictions of my own sin in iron. In other words, verses 10 and 11, what the Lord is telling us is that he made us to be a sinner. That's a work of grace, isn't it? You show me a sinner, I'll show you a work of grace. Lord, I, I couldn't, couldn't do anything to save myself. Look at, uh, therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. I thought, I can get myself out of this. And I only added to my sin by trying to fix my own problem <laughs> rather than coming to Christ. And I put myself under the burden of the law, thinking, well, if I can just do more to fix my own situation, then I can, I can get things right with God. I didn't know it was of grace. I, I was still thinking that it was of works. And then I looked around. It wasn't enough. And I looked around, and there was no one to help me. No man to help me. My wife couldn't help me. My husband couldn't help me. My children couldn't help me. My parents couldn't help me. Preacher couldn't help me. There was no man to help me. Then, <laughs> then, you know, you, you, you heard people say, maybe you said, I've said it. Well, there's nothing left to do but pray. The only time you really pray is when there's nothing left to do. If you're praying and working at the same time, you're not really praying. Praying is pouring out your soul to God. Lord, I, there, I, there's nobody to help me. I've got to have you, Lord. It, you see, then, <laughs> when they found no man to help, when they were under the burden of the law, when they were dead in their trespasses and sins, when they were able to acknowledge that they were, in fact, rebels against God. And somebody said, well, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm... Believe what God says about you. That's what I want to say. We've got some of the sweetest, nicest, most obedient children in this congregation that you'll find anywhere in the world.
And they may have a tendency to look at themselves and compare themselves to other kids that are doing things they wouldn't do, and they think, well, I'm not like that. Believe what God says about you. God says every imagination of your heart is only evil in that continual. God says you are at enmity against me. God says you are a sinner. You see, the only reason you wouldn't believe that is if you were comparing yourself to someone else rather than standing in the presence of God and realizing there's nothing in me that's like him. Everything about me falls short of his glory. He's right. I am a sinner. I am in darkness. I am bound by my sin of unbelief. And I have rebelled against the word of God. And I've not taken seriously the counsel of the Most High. And I've been brought down low under my labor, looking to my life and my labor to, 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 to try to find some answers to my problem. And there was no man to help me. Then I cried unto the Lord in my trouble, and he saved me out of my distresses. <laughs> you see, that's the only time we're going to cry. Is when... When verses 10, 11, and 12 become real to you, then you will cry. You'll cry. And you won't just cry to anybody. You'll cry to the Lord. And here's the promise of God. You cry out to him. He's going to hear you, and he's going to save you. <laughs> no one's ever cried to Christ as a sinner, casting all their hope on him, believing that he's finished the work and has not been saved. No one's ever done that. He saved them out of their distresses. Now, that doesn't mean the distresses of life. Life is full of distresses. And and. You know, you, you may have more distresses as a believer than you had as an unbeliever. <laughs> and, and in one sense, there's never going to be an end to that. Things are only going to get more complicated and more difficult in this, in this world. But here's the distress. It's the distress of sin, isn't it? <laughs> you know, that, that which is born in the storm often dies in the calm. People who get religious because they're in the middle of a trouble in this world, when the trouble goes away, they don't need God anymore, and they usually go away. But one sin, one problem that you and I have that never goes away, that's our sin problem, isn't it? And if we come to God as a sinner, we'll always need a Savior because we're always going to be a sinner. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break the bands asunder. <laughs> He gave them the grace to believe. <laughs> and now they can't not believe. <laughs> All they can do is believe. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. His wonderful works, his work of redemption. The difference between law and grace is that those who have been saved by grace praise the Lord for his wonderful works and acknowledge him for all that they have in this world and in the next. Those who are looking to their works will add to the equation something they've done, a decision they've made, a work they've performed, something they're not doing.
Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they, even they, <laughs> Lord, why would you give it? Why would you enable me to do this? The whole world is full of people, billions of people that don't know the difference between law and grace. Even they <laughs> shall understand his loving kindness. Our Heavenly Father, might you be pleased that even me, even us, would have your discerning grace to believe on Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Two thirty six. Let's stand together. Two thirty six. Yes, uh, Trisha wanted me to remind everybody, next Sunday, that's a week from today, we're having covered dish after services. The old-fashioned the, the old kind. Everybody bring something and we'll all share it. <laughs>